Good evening. We'd like to welcome everyone to the November 14th, 2017 regular board meeting of the Forsyth County Board of Education. We'll start off with our invocation and pledge led by Nancy Roche. If you could all stand as you're able. A prayer of thankfulness by Abby Willowroot. For today I am grateful, for tomorrow I am hopeful. For my life I am blessed. I thank my ancestors for their labor, labors and survival. I thank my contemporaries for their companionship. I thank my descendants for carrying me with them. For, day, for today, I do the best in all things. For tomorrow, I honor and heal the environment. For my life, I work to be a healthy cell in the body of the universe. I honor the journey of my life with conscious living and honor the lives of all that I meet and those I will never know. Please th bless th all those who are suffering at this time, and I hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving celebration next week. Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> All right, we have an agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? So Sorry, moved. Second. Motion by Darla, a second by Tom. All in favor? That is unanimous. We're going to do recognitions next with Dr. Salome leading that. We ask that those who are here for that stay through the end of that, and we'll take a brief break after that for those who wish to leave. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to do the uh, recognitions this evening. It is always the best part of the evening. First, we'd like to start with our 2017 Georgia School Bus Safety Poster Contest winner, Enrique Hernandez. Enrique is a Vickery Creek Middle School student, eighth grader, and he plays third in the state. His teacher is Erin Daniel. Come on down, Enrique. <laughs> here tonight to support him please stand and let us say thank you to you too because without your support he wouldn't be here thank you now i'd like to call up the employee of the month but first let's have nissan uh, our representatives from Nissan, or, or Mally Nissan are here. They are going to award the winner tonight a $500 um, amount and then $500 <laughs> to the school. So thank you, Mally, for that. We would <laughs> Robin Gravett, would you come on down and let us let me tell them about you, please. Robin is the Sony Elementary Data Clerk and she is our employee of the month. Come on down, Robin. We get to this one. We're going to look at you while I read some of the comments. <laughs> Make you really get uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, lots of comments were made about Robin, and I've just selected a few. These are, Robin is the backbone of our school. I believe she should receive this honor because so much of what Robin does is behind the scenes and rarely gets recognized. She is very humble and does not want recognition, but she is so deserving of this honor. She gives 110% all the time. Robin is constantly working hard to make sure that all her data is correct and that deadlines are met. She is extremely organized, effective, helpful, and proactive. And there's no <laughs> Robin always gets the job done. I personally admire how dedicated Robin is to her job and others. Robin goes above and beyond to support our school culture. She greets staff members, places kids, plans events, volunteers, and other things. To sum it all up, Robin is a friend to all and is a great first face or first content contact for visitors at Sony Elementary. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
if you are here to support our wonderful employee, would you please stand and let us thank you for being here too. Next is our superior spotlight. Michelle Slayton. We got Michelle, there she is, I couldn't find her. Michelle as the superior spotlight for tonight. Turn it over to you. Hey, I'm a little nervous, but um, no, let me tell. I'm just going to do a quick introduction of how I connected the dots here, and then let these wonderful kids run away with it. When I first started in this position, I was really part of what I was doing was researching that in our dropout rate, we have way too many Hispanic students dropping out. Not long after that, and it just really touched my heart, and so I was reading articles and doing a lot of research. What can we do to help keep these kids in school? Well, at that point, Carl Mercer became the print, was named principal at West Forsyth, and he sent me an email saying, look, I thought you'd like to know about this organization called HOPE. H-O-P-E stands for Hispanic Organization Promoting Education. So when I happened to be out west during their uh, open house and the students were there, I happened to go by the table and I saw their sign and I went, oh, you guys are the hope people. And I was so excited. Well, then I made contact with that face and I went, there's one of my former second graders right there. So the fact that she was there made me even more excited. So um, in that connection, after uh, they invited me to their kickoff, you guys, they were on fire. You're going to see their excitement. I reached out to other principals, and Mitch Young is bringing a chapter of hope to his school next year. So that's all that my quick introduction. I'm going to turn it over to them. You guys are going to be so excited to see what they're doing. All right. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nicholas Montoya, and I'm the president of the Westerside High School Hope Chapter. So like Mrs. Slayton said, HOPE stands for Hispanic Organization Promoting Education. And as the name implies, it's a club that's mission is to increase the graduation rate among Hispanic high school students through leadership, education, and community service. The vision is to see Hispanic high school students graduate high school, unleash their potential, and create a lasting legacy for future generations. We work towards this mission and vision through all the different events we have at Westerside. We have general monthly meetings, we have specialty meetings, we have community service, we have um, social outings, we have all these different things that provide our students and our members with an outlet and with lots of motivation. We've been able to impact the students greatly at West Forsyth and leave a lasting footprint on our school. It has also impacted us as individuals. For me personally, it's impacted me through education. One thing about being a legacy leader is that we get provided with a graduation coach or a Hope alumnus now in college who serves as a mentor. My graduation coach's name is Carla Chavez and she's a freshman at Harvard University, which is my dream school. She has motivated me greatly to persevere and to push myself and to never give up. And she has instilled in me the same attitude that I wanna give on to our members, the yes you can attitude, the attitude that you can do anything if you set your mind to it. But that's enough for me. Now the other legacy leaders are going to talk about how hope has impacted them. Uh, I'm Miguel Sanchez. I'm the VP of Development at West Forsyth High School. Um, a couple of the biggest ways that hope has impacted me is through having a support system and really just my future overall and other opportunities. Um, being a senior, it's really stressful. So my graduation coach, Cesar, has helped me a lot with like time management skills, applying to college, scholarship stuff. And something I really want to talk about is I would have never gotten this opportunity with uh, the Posse Scholarship. And what the Posse Scholarship is, is a leadership merit scholarship. And they go through 1,500 students all around Atlanta and Georgia. And they pick 60. And I am a finalist for George Washington University. And honestly, I just really <laughs> And honestly, like, because of hope, that never would have happened. Or because of hope, that I got, if there wasn't for hope, that would never would have happened. And I'm just really thankful <laughs> for hope. It's awesome. My name is Jennifer Galvin, and I am the VP of Service for our chapter. So for me, hope is not only an organization which I'm part of, but it turned into a family for me. From our advisors, my grad coach, to my fellow legacy leaders, they constantly push me to strive forward, to, so, to be self-motivated, 
to be the best that I can be for our members at West Forsyth and with our members. It's like every month, every time we have our, our meeting, it's like a family reunion. We all get along, we all talk. It doesn't matter if you didn't know the person's name, you just start a bond with them, which is so important for, for us to give them a sense of we're not only just a club that you meet once a month, but we are a family. They can, they can count on us, knowing, and we know that we can count on our leaders. And also, we've made, we all made amazing relationships and friendships with the other 43 schools across the state that also have hope. And it's an amazing feeling to know, oh, I'm not just part of a club at school, but I'm part of a family. Hi, um, my name is Lady Morales. I'm a VP of Communications for Hope. And um, I just want to say that hope has had an impact in my life, a huge impact in my life, because they given me a sense of optimism that it's hard to find in uh, any other club. Uh, we had been able to attend to uh, a lot of events that they do, uh, such as the HYLS during the summer and monthly retreats. And honestly, they give us uh, role models and they're fantastic because they share stories and you just leave that room with the thought that you said, okay, I can do this through work, hard work and optimism and just rock and just knowing that you're gonna do something with your life and that you can reach anything if you put hard work on it. the principal at West Versailles who brought hope to that school. <laughs> uh, the two hope sponsors, Mimi Weber and Carly Grippentrog, said that right. <laughs> and very honored to have David Araya, the founder of Hope with us tonight to support these kiddos. How long has Hope been in existence? Hope has been in existence for eight years. We actually celebrated eight years yesterday, as Founders Day. Um, mm -hmm. As I mentioned, we're actually in 44 high schools across the state, 17 school districts, over 44, uh, over 3,000 students, and we have a 100% graduation rate. Oh, oh wow. wow. That was really inspiring. Yeah. All righty. Yeah. We're going to take a brief break right now for anybody who would like to leave after the presentations. And if you'd like to stay behind for the business portion of our meeting, you're certainly welcome. All right. Next up, we have the consent agenda. I assume everybody's had time to review that. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion by Tom, a second by Nancy. All in favor? That is unanimous. Next up, we have public participation. <coughs> Board policy BCBI sets forth the rules for public participation, and copies are available on the back table. Anyone requesting to speak to the board must sign the form indicating they've read and will follow the requirements of this policy. Public participation is designed to allow citizens to speak to the board, and board members do not respond during that part of the agenda unless specific <coughs> question, they have specific, specific questions for the presenter. We have five speakers tonight, so we will allow about five minutes per speaker. First, we have Shannon Cox from Three Chimneys 
farms in regard to redistricting. We just come up to the. Um, hello, my name is Shannon Cox, and I am representing Three Chimneys Farms. Um, first, I would like to thank you for your service on the board. We recognize the county's accomplishments thus far, and especially during this challenging period of redistricting. Thank you to the board for giving us the opportunity to speak. Three Chimneys Farms participated early in the redistricting, redistricting process, beginning with the August 8th attendance at the very first proposed timeline provided by the BOE's appointed committee. Milestones data was presented and the board stopped the presentation to reiterate it is important for us to point out that our growth has not impacted our student achievement. Not only are we maintaining, but we continue to improve as we grow. This is a fabulous school district that is drawing the attention of the state and encouraging the growth to our area. We as a neighborhood are proud of our teachers and children's hard work and success. All of our schools are excellent and Denmark High School will follow suit. After the proposed timeline on August 15th, we requested our representatives to come speak with our community and on August 17th, we discussed the process, timeline, criteria and considerations. We informed the board we'd be we were informed that the board would be considering future growth, logistics, travel, traffic patterns, and feeder and patterns, in addition to the headcount needed to successfully open Denmark. The first draft was presented to the board in September. There was a disproportionate redistricting of students to include the 226 students to Denmark from the west, 1,564 students to Denmark from south. 389 students from Lambert to South. Denmark's goal was to open with 1,690 students, 1,300 without seniors. Why was that goal so low when the Lambert district is projected to grow 4% South district at 7% and West even higher? Please review and prevent the scenario of moving us out of Lambert only to be moved back in once South Forsyth becomes too overcrowded and ironically using proximity as a criteria. <coughs> <clears throat> Apologize. Uh, the committee referenced East Forsyth planning and stated that district map lines were drawn, keeping in mind, quotes, that the redistricting committee certainly kept in mind the future building and projects looking at in the future when East High School is opened and what we needed to do in West High School. We needed to keep West High School where we need it or think it needs to be. We needed to be looking at the future when East High School opens. We, as in the committee, to meet our headcounts are we as the county. The board referenced future planning but did not ask any detailed questions regarding East Forsyth. Uh, for Why do we need to overpopulate particular districts over the next five years to deal with overcrowding with the assumption that East High School will even be built until the voters of this county approve it? A school that was originally planned for opening in 2011 that could not open due to uncontrollable factors. East is not a guarantee. Why would West population be the only district taken into that consideration? If future schools, Central and North districts have been evaluated, why have these numbers not been provided and why have not all the study area numbers been published if they were available to be evaluated? Why was that not presented to the Board of Education in meeting? On September 12th, the committee unveiled the official criteria, which no longer included future planning of these four sites, inc included data-driven results to include populating Denmark, relieving South Lambert West, minimizing temporary classrooms, and maintain feeder patterns. Where is the data for this data-driven process? Where is the data on more than just neighborhoods targeted for redistricting? Was the BOE's appointed committee not asked to consider other factors? The BOE received feedback via online service, uh, surveys um, quoted by Jennifer, I do apologize, Caracolio um, and Joey Perkle as over 4,000 surveys. We submitted online feedback, emails, letters, calls, petitions based on the guidance that we were provided. We responded with research on our dis decidedly minimal impact <coughs> from Three Chimneys Farm to addressing any of those issues presented to our board, board of education representatives and, and encourage them to represent us. Information on proximity, travel patterns, community impact, transportation concerns were shared. We included su 
suggestions on other options. We personally have zero impact on Denmark. Where is the data that demonstrates considerations of other neighborhoods for inclusion in redistricting to South or Denmark? Where were the criteria individual representatives shared as important with local communities included in this fluid process? You encouraged us to put our efforts, time, and resources into criteria you later deemed net less important and summed it up as a large population with proximity concerns, demonstrating that not all the feedback was considered. Where are the summaries of the feedback? What for an 80% approval rating? What were the 20, 20% uh, you know, uh, feedback on criteria? Am I within my five minutes? You're done. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Gracie Eglund, if I've got that correct. Did I say your name right, honey? England. England. Yes. Okay. I like the company. Hi, my name is Gracie, and I will be a rising junior currently attending South Forsyth High School. I wanted to speak tonight because although I only live 1.6 miles away from South Forsyth High School, I am redistricted to Denmark High, 6.3 miles away, and on the other side of Highway 400. I've spent the last year and a half working hard academically and building relationships, not only with students, but other teachers, through extracurricular activities and programs such as Habitudes and Advisement. It is what we have been learning in these Habitudes periods that has encouraged me to speak out. With programs such as Habitudes, the meaning is to build bonds with other students while also allowing students to find themselves, giving them confidence, a voice, and showing them that they matter. Despite what we have been taught in the classroom, there has been a disregard for the voices raised in regards to the redistricting. Through all the efforts put into the redistricting by parents and students, no changes have been made. How can you tell the students and classrooms that every voice matters? that you can make a change, but then ignore the voices of those wanting change right now. This is providing a negative and false example to us students who believe that if they put their mind to something, change can happen. What kind of example is this providing for students of all grades? On October 22nd, I wrote a letter with parts of what I've said tonight. I didn't send it because it was filled with anger and frustration, but on this final voting night, I have decided to apply what I've learned and speak out. I do not understand why the proximity and safety of students does not matter and why now, as a junior, I will have to start all over. Junior year is the most important and most difficult year of high school. I hope after hearing a personal story from a student deeply affected by the redistricting, you listen to all of our voices and make the changes that make sense. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, please. Our next speaker is Ella Mihak, a teach at Three Chimneys Junior. And again, if you could correct your pronunciation of your name. Is yeah. it Ella Mihak? Mihak, I got it. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, I'm a rising junior, and this decision to be moved to a different school halfway in my high school career has many internal inf effects on my life and possibly college. The whole reason that we try so hard to succeed in high school is to take that knowledge into high into college. Colleges look at club enrollment and teacher recommendation, and that's something that has to be built over a course of a couple years. I'm currently doing that with both my freshman and my sophomore teachers, but by switching schools, I'll be starting over completely. And I won't have enough time to build new, strong relationships with teachers at the other school. And also, I'm currently active in a club, and I'm in line to be president next year. Junior year is crucial for every high schooler because um, we have to go through all these tests and homework. So junior year is just the year where you have to focus on your club involvement and your high school recommendations and um, all your classes. And you're wanting us to move completely to a new environment and interact in a new atmosphere right in the middle. This year is the main opportunity for high schoolers to get leadership positions because it is so important for college applications. Rising juniors should be granted to stay for the, the remainder of the years because of all the commitments and relationships we've built along the way. 
something that both middle school and high school um, has preached for us is to get involved. And it's hard to get involved and become a leader when we're starting right halfway in the year and we only have two remainder years in a brand new school. In addition, all the pressures of finding new leadership positions and involvements will cause an abundant amount of stress and anxiety on top of all the schoolwork we're given. So I'd like to thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next, we have Teresa Weiner. Teresa? Hello. My name is Teresa Weimer, and I'd like to speak um, about your out-of-district requests. I noticed that the new one, as of November 7th, has the four criteria for getting an out-of-district request um, approved. And it only allowed for orchestra to be the one fine mm -hmm. art that you approved. Um, and I know you've heard from me before. I spoke at the public hearing, and I've emailed Ms. Morrissey a number of times, but I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that this was really important to so many families and students um, who might be involved in fine arts outside of orchestra. My son is in indoor drumline, which is a percussion is a separate class, and it's not going to be provided at Denmark once the new school starts up. He attends West Forsyth. It took eight years for them to get the program up and running. Um, my son wants to major in music. He wants to be in drumline in college. He wants to do it professionally. And if it's not available at hit for him at the new school, he's not going to be prepared for this in the future. And I mean, based on what I've seen, it sounds like you're not going to be very flexible with the out-of-district request because it specifically says you know, fine arts and with the exception of orchestra, would not be approved. So I just want you to consider case-by-case -case basis, individual circumstances, give your principals the flexibility to look at your students and say, yes, this program is not going to be at the new school, and consider allowing <coughs> some students to be you know, approved and out of district request. Um, at my son school, only two students are affected, only two percussionists are affected by this. And I know that you say West Forsyth is overcrowded, but it's not nearly as bad as Lambert or South Forsyth. I just ask that you would consider each student, each individual case, and give your principals the power to approve these out of district Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last, we have Scott Konings. My name is Scott Koenigs. I am representing the Stony Point Corridor, and I live in Creekstone Estates Subdivision. I know it's getting uh, pretty late in the game here. Uh, the redistricting has been going on for a little while, and I guess the vote is scheduled for tonight. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to give you some feedback. I'm going to give you credit where credit is deserved. And uh, I'm also going to challenge you on some areas that I don't think went as well in the redistricting. And at the end, I'm going to make a recommendation uh, that I think will make if you choose to, that would make all your lives easier. No smiles tonight for that. <laughs> um, first of all, when it comes to redistricting, and I'm on slide two here, um, everybody in this audience wants what's in the best interest of the school district. Even though we fight for our own subdivisions, we fight for our own schools, we want what's in the best interest of the school dr district, just like I think most of you do. Uh, we also want to make sure that Forsyth schools stay among the best in Georgia. That's not changing. Um, Dr. Bearden, you mentioned transparency on October 10th. It was important for you that uh, this, this process has transparency. We want transparency as well. And uh, we also think uh, we, we want a, a system of checks and balances. And when you look on, the, on slide two here, um, you know, there, there is very much two-way conversation between the redistricting committee and the superintendent, superintendent committee and the board board and the redistricting committee, but when it, comes to, when it comes to communication between the public and the redistricting committee, there is none. And when it comes to 
communication between the public and the board, it's one way. Tonight I get to talk to you. Last week you got to talk amongst yourselves, but we couldn't talk back and forth. And that doesn't feel like a very transparent process. I know it's the way it is, but it just doesn't feel, feel very transparent. So I'd like to go to slide three. And uh, at, the public, uh, at the public meeting we had at West High School, I showed you this slide. Um, and I, and I move you, uh, ask you to focus your eyes on 2017. Um, in DeSana Middle School, the uh, Central District pr projected that uh, there would be 805 students in 2017 at DeSana. In reality, there's 850. This school district is growing a lot faster than what projections were. Go to the next slide. I also showed you that uh, Midway and DeSana were both growing over 20%. The two fastest growing schools in the district are in the Denmark, uh, in the school district are in the Denmark district. Now, I showed you that. We never heard any feedback. We never heard if anything was ever done with this. I don't know if you guys did it. You know, if it, did anybody ask a question? Hmm, that's an interesting fact. Maybe we should look into that. And as a public, I got to tell you, we didn't hear anything in return whether anybody chose to look into that fact. Because it is interesting when, when, the school that, uh, when, the, when the central district is, is projecting 15% growth and it's actually 22.5% growth, something's amiss there. And I'll take you to the next slide, slide number five. Um, you can see here that South, South is currently at 146% capacity. Uh, after the changes that were made to the map, it's going to be at 97% capacity. I'm not sure if you realize that or not, but South is projected to be at 97% capacity. West, there was no changes, so they're still at their 114% capacity, and Lambert will be at 110% capacity. Um, the one question that I had, and a, a lot of people have, is does anybody know what the projected enrollment is in Denmark next August? We made changes. Does any, I mean, do we know what the enrollment is? We, we're just here to listen for you tonight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we honestly, I've never heard that. You know, we've heard that yeah. there's 13, 1,300 is the goal, but we've made changes um, since that goal was established, and I don't know, I actually don't know what the, uh, the number is. The changes we made would have made it go up. Okay. All right, we'll go to the next slide. Um, and I want you to hear me on this one. There, there is a perception of conflict, uh, conflict of interest in the community, and I'm not saying there is conflict of interest. I'm saying there's a perception of conflict of interest. When you look at this map, one person on the uh, redistricting committee lives very, very close to where the Denmark line was drawn. Um, two people on the board live very, very close to redistricting lines. Now, we've heard from you that Denmark's going to be a great school. We've heard from you. We, ho we hope it's a great school. But yet, anybody who is in the decision-making process here who had the chance to redistrict their neighborhood or to, to, to make any influence to redistrict their neighborhood. They didn't do that. Now, again, it's a perception. I hope it's not reality, but it is a perception that's out there, and uh, it's one that I think needs to be addressed. Um, we just didn't see any visible signs of checks and balances uh, that were out there. Next slide, um, redistricting criteria timeline. Your time is up, so if you can maybe we'll add one more minute to wrap it up, but if you can. OK. Um, all right, slide seven. I I'm not going to go over it a lot. There was a quote in the paper last night that said uh, the redistricting criteria has never changed. It's been the same since 2008. Um, I'm showing you uh, five different redistricting criteria over the last two months. So I think uh, you, you know, we can do better than that. We can do better than that. We as a committee can. Um, I gave you some grades uh, on the next slide. I wish we had more time. Um, the one I'm going to focus on, you know, there are some things we did a great job. You did an absolutely great job. Um, the one that I'm going to focus, uh, focus on is the plan for East High School, which is, uh, if you go to slide nine, um, Dr. Bearden, on October 10th, you, you, you mentioned that uh, you read a statement, and part of it was, this is a data-driven process. This, this process was very data-driven. And um, I think there was a lot of data presented. There was a lot of data presented. But when it came to the criteria that uh, planning for East High School, I went, I went back and I watched all the, all the board meetings. I talked about redistricting. And I looked for any data about East High School. And there was, there was one question asked about East High School, but there was no data. You know, nobody was asking questions like, uh, 
Um, you know, what, what are the projected populations of the high school? You know, what, is, what is the projected population of Lambert in five years, of West in five years, of North in five years, of Central in five years? And those things would tell a story for us if East is truly, if <coughs> East is truly necessary and if it's, it's necessary to consider now any of those questions that anybody would have asked and that, and that your redistricting committee would have brought to us, brought to you in front of the board, would have been very beneficial for us as members of the community to understand where, where, what's happening. So, you know, we just want to, we just want to understand the data when it comes to East High School. It's not been presented up to this point, yet it's a significant criteria that you used. All right, the last thing I have is just a request. There have been a lot of, there are a lot of unanswered questions up to this point. And our request is that you put it, put it on hold, put the vote on hold for 30 to 45 days. And uh, Dr. Bearden, you and your committee, I think, should engage a third party. There are, sp there are third parties that specialize in redistricting. They can do that. And, and, and uh, you engage them. You then provide the data to the BOE that's missing. There's a lot of, lot of data that's been, been missing. And I think if you do that for 30 to 45 days, put this on hold, you will find that this group will be, be have much more confidence in you, have much more confidence in the transparency. Um, you're going to lower your legal risk, you're going to get greater community support, and most importantly, I think you're going to get the best redistricting plan. And I'll tell you, if the best redistricting plan 30 to 45 days from now is the one that you have on the table, then I think we will all support it. But we would appreciate <laughs> Well, thank you. It was a very thorough presentation. We appreciate that. I do have one question, and I think I have asked you this question, so I do want to verify because I think you had on this chart showing the increase of DeSanta after its first year opened. One of the reasons there is often a bump is because the siblings of yep. those students are mm -hmm. they populate the school the following yeah. year. Did your data take into effect that? Yeah, our, da that our data took into consideration, and if you see from year one to year two, it goes up quite a bit, and then we leveled it off thereafter. Okay. But so I don't, we it, did talk about Yes, that. we did talk okay. about that. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Next on our agenda is presentation and discussion, and that's the finance report with Mr. Rick Gunn. Good evening. Uh, tonight I bring you the October financials. Uh, statement of cash receipts and disbursements for the month began with $25.5 million, receipts of $32.2 million, disbursements of $35.6 million, leaving the balance of a little over $22 million. Uh, this is our year to date budget report through October 31st. As you can see, our tax revenues, or excuse me, our overall revenues are at 23%, and we're just now starting to see some of the tax revenues coming in for the year. Uh, this is a, uh, showing our receipts and disbursements. Uh, we should be at 33.33% for the year. Uh, we're at 33.76, so we're right where we should be. Uh, debt service cash analysis, these are all the funds that are available for debt service. Uh, we actually had no debt service payments for this month. And if you look to the right in the SPLOS 5 column, uh, you can see SPLOS tax for the month it was a little over $3 million. Wow. Uh, this is an analysis of our investments for the month. Uh, no changes really other than the uh, SPLOS coming in the SPLOS 5. And this is a SPLOS 5 activity to date. Uh, all three payments that we've received have been over $3 million, which is a good trend. And then all of the schools reported for the month, uh, this slide being the elementaries, middles and the highs, and the ending cash balance in the schools of $9.3 million. Any questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next, we have action items. We have policy JBCCA2 with Mr. Perkle. Good afternoon. Uh, policy JBCCA2 was um, presented to you at your meeting last month. Uh, it actually 
uh, lay on the table for 30 days to receive legal input. Um, based on the legal input, there are a couple of changes to this policy. Um, and that is, uh, there's an addition, which is, uh, an, which is number two, all of number two. This is the unsafe school choice option. Uh, so number two, according to our legal um, input and authorities, is the development and submission of the GADOE of the uh, corrective action plan for each school identified as a persistently dangerous school within 20 school days after notification to the school district by the uh, Georgia Department of Education that a school has been identified. So they suggested that we add that um, number two. And then also on number three, uh, their suggestion was that we add, um, where it says within 10 days where we had of a commission of the offense, that we change that and say of the school district's determination by official action that the student has been a victim of a violent criminal offense if the student wishes to transfer to another school. Um, so based on the legal input and those two changes, I asked the superintendent for a recommendation for approval for the um, policy JBCCA. Yeah, thank you. Recommend approval. Do we have a motion? Is it moved? Second. Motion by Nancy, a second by Ann. All in favor? That is unanimous. <laughs> Next, we have approval of the 2018-19 school calendar, again with Mr. Perkle. Yes, ma'am. Um, presented um, last week at your work session, uh, the a summary of the feedback for the school calendar. Um, so just to summarize, um, basically just some of the highlights of the school calendar. The start date is August the 2nd, which again is on a Thursday, uh, which seemed to be very popular um, for the Thursday. Um, week, there's a week of fall break. The winter break begins on December the 21st. Spring break is the first full week in April, which is consistent with other metro systems. Uh, there are five pre-planning days, two post-planning days, and four professional planning <coughs> days for staff members. Um, and the school year ends prior to Memorial Day. So it's typically the same format the school calendar's been for the last several years. So I'll ask the superintendent for a recommendation for approval of the school calendar. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the school calendar? So moved. Second. Motion by Tom, a second by Ann. All in favor? That is unanimous. The next item up is a final approval of the 2018-19 district lines. Again, Mr. Perkle. Okay. Um, you as a board amended the district lines at your November 2nd work session, so at this time I'll ask the superintendent for a recommendation. I uh, recommend the uh, board approve the uh, redistricting lines as amended by the board. Is there a motion at least for discussion? Second. Motion by Ann and a second by Tom. Is there any discussion? All right, well, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say that that is, has been a very difficult decision for all of us to make. And we have listened, we have read, we've gotten phone calls, and we did consider questions that were brought to our attention and did talk to the staff about it. And I, I feel comfortable with the map that as it is being presented. Anybody else? I got to go here. I'm just going to read some thoughts so that I keep them in order. I do think we all entered this process hoping for the best resolution, but realizing it was going to be difficult to achieve. Finding a balance between reaching the right numbers of students at Denmark and also reducing overcrowding at our existing schools to some appropriate level <coughs> has been very hard. As a board, we need to ensure quality and e equity at each of our schools, but we also must balance the reality of what we are dealing with is real students and not just numbers on a map. We have heard the feedback. And I want to say we have phone calls, emails, we have read them all. And I know I have tried to reply to some, but we'll never catch up to reading. We want to, but to do it thoughtfully, it just can't be done with a sheer volume. But we have tried. Um, I do want to say also that we have heard back from those who are not necessarily happy. And there's some that do not sympathize with those communities that are moving. We've also heard from those who have accepted and embraced the moves that their students are as well. I think the parents that have speak, spoken in opposition are advocating for their students, trying to keep their day-to-day -day lives functioning the best they can for their families. Our schools are a big part of our community and our daily commute. 
changing their schools should be done with compassion, and I wish that everybody would look at both sides and appreciate each other's concerns. For the Stony Point area, it has been difficult that these students are in an area needed to populate Denmark High. It has also been hard because these students are so close to the South Forsyth campus, and proximity should be a factor in our decision. Three Chimneys Farm is in a similar situation. Um, I have struggled with that quite a bit, and I have not come to terms with that. Bottom line, I think it's common sense that sometimes we have to look at proximity. And yes, we did. I can pull them all out. I don't want to go into the details again, but we have looked <coughs> at the location of the school and proximity to the campus. I do believe the students can walk. There's Three Chimneys Farm. There's the trail. There's the 10-foot section that is not technically maintained by the county, but it is right there. That's the distance. That's my dog from the property line to there. That's the distance from the property line to the nearest house. I do think proximity matters, and I do think that they are close. I know we need to meet numbers, but I just think sometimes common sense takes place, and I still think the three chimneys should have changed. I understand populating future schools needed to be factored in, and students at South here are just as important as those are, are factored in in the future. We have students here now and their experiences now. I think that's all I have to say. I don't think anybody's changing their opinions. I do think the board has worked hard, and I do want to thank the staff because I know you have worked hard in this and it has been a long process, so any decisions made tonight are no reflection of our, our appreciation of your efforts on this at behalf. We really know it's been a hard, hard thank job. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, I would say uh, one other thing, just the thank you to the engagement of the community. I know what this is like. We've all been through this, and it's a, a very hard, traumatic, emotional time. Our kids are important, so we understand that. So we thank you for your time and your engagement in the process. Is there any further discussion? We have a motion and a second. All in favor? All opposed? Thank you. Trying to find my agenda here. Sorry. Anybody have an agenda I can read? Redistricting out of district rules. All right. Next up is the redistricting out of district rules. Mr. Perthel again. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you asked us to put together language regarding the out of district siblings procedures, which we did that. Uh, the redistricting committee recommends that you keep the language as we've done in the past. Uh, we rec recommend that if you wanted to consider those changes that we wait until the next redistricting to do that. So at this point, I'll ask the superintendent for a recommendation. Yeah, I just want to say I, I, I echo what Mr. Perkle said, and, and I understand the conversation we had last time about, about the whole issue around siblings, but I think it's so late in the process. Uh, we need to table that conversation until the next time we redistrict. So I do agree with the redistricting, redistricting committee. We go back to the out-of-district procedures we had in place from the very beginning of the process, which is no change from previous redistricting, and I recommend you approve that. Mm -hmm. To that end, I'd like to make a motion that we support Dr. Beard and the committee's recommendation to stay with the original suggested guidelines for redistricting, grandfathering of siblings, etc. Second. Second. I have a second by Tom. Any more discussion on that? I think I, th I think it needs adjusting honestly. I think it needs to be adjusted, but I think that it is that we need to go with what we've got right now and, and before the next one we need to review it and look at it. Excuse me. Ms. Lett, just want to clarify, you're, at this, you're talking about the siblings part or the entire thing? I think we should revisit the whole thing before right. we redistrict again, but I think it's too late to revisit it now and we need to leave it with what it is. Right. Okay. There has been a lot of discussion in, on whether to retain the juniors at the high schools, and that has not been something any of the board mm -hmm. members have taken lightly. We have both, all, I think, have gone back and forth on that. I will make an attempt, if it's all right, to su try to summarize why we are at where we're at with juniors at this stage. We have a new high school opening that needs to have juniors there to fulfill it. There is opportunities for leadership at that new school. We did talk about only having the juniors stay back at existing to existing schools. We thought that would be slightly unfair to those 
at Denmark will be forced to move. Um, it was not an easy decision. Uh, we do realize the importance of the junior year, and it's something we did struggle with. I don't know if anybody, please, this is public. Uh, does anybody have any other comments? And you? Okay. Do we, we have a motion and a second already? Do yeah, we? Do. Okay, yeah. we have a motion and a second. All in favor of keeping the rules as they have been described. Thank you. That is unanimous. Next on our agenda is points of information. Dr. Bearden, anything you'd like to share? No, nothing tonight. All right. Next, we have executive session. Do I have a motion to go into executive for personnel? So moved. Second. Motion by Nancy, a second by Tom. All in favor? Thank you.